So I'm going to show the research that we've been doing in my lab, and some of you may have already seen parts of it, but I got some videos to show. And then at the end, I'll talk about where open source has worked into the project and where we would like to, you know, we really should contribute back open source stuff. So first of all, I'm going to talk about graphics. I'm going to talk about daylighting design. So I'm not an architect, but I'm a wannabe architect, like buildings, and making buildings better by incorporating daylighting in a good way. Um, so I'll talk about that. And then this thing called spatially augmented reality, which is augmented reality, but spatial or something like that. And MPAC comes in too, so it's you know, a lot of stuff, and I will try to talk 20 minutes or so. Okay. Um, so, what's daylighting design? It's trying to make good use of daylighting in your buildings so that you can reduce the amount of electric light you're using and just make them more pleasant places to be. I really like this room because it's got nice windows in it and it's providing good ambient light and you can even look at the projector screen. So I'd say this is a pretty good room for daylighting. Uh, this is another classroom uh, on campus. My living room I like too, but there's an unfortunate problem when I sit down on my couch around 6 p.m. at night, the sun happens to squeak through the blinds in such a way when I'm sitting on my screen I can't look at my laptop. And so uh, one of the things we'd like to do with architectural daylighting design is help people understand where this glare situation is going to come in, where there's a really bright thing in your field of view and you're trying to focus on your screen. So there's some challenges and it's of course complicated and expensive and that's why we need some tools for it. So we've got this, instead of just having a computer application, we built this tangible interface is the buzzword. Uh, tangible interface uh, where multiple people can gather to look at stuff. So in this case, I've got multiple students pretending to be architects standing around a desk or a table. They're going to build a small mock-up of a design that they're considering, including placing windows and specifying which direction is north. Uh, there's a camera that detects what they've built and their projectors that will give a visualization of the simulation of daylighting. So I'll show a video. Oh, not yet. Uh, just a little bit more about the tangible interface. So again, there's a, a collection of cardboard modules off to the side on a table. You can pull out whichever ones you want. Might not be exactly the right length, but that's okay. You can build kind of a sloppy design. Um, the little paper slips that slip over the top edges, that specifies that there's a window on the side. And they're on the top edge just because that's maybe a single camera looking at them. But of course, there's different, different ways you can specify this. Camera detects the stuff it sees. And we end up with a 3D model after some work. And this 3D model is then what we do our simulation on. So now I'll just show a video of the design process. So if you sloppily build some stuff, it's okay if you don't have the long enough walls, you just leave some gaps. Um, uh, put some markers on the table that specify what color the walls are and specify a north arrow. And then after a short wait, this is what that place is going to look like at noon on a particular day of the year. And then you can also play an animation because these are projectors and you can spit out anything. So designing a nice user interface that makes this it's easy for people to use, um, maybe people who aren't specifically skilled with all the CAD modeling tools and everything. And then of course, if you don't like something about it, if you realize there's going to be glare, you could shuffle the walls around, you know, with the color of the walls, change things about it, and again, get another simulation of a time-lapse animation. And this is you know, something you could walk around and actually see um, on the table. Okay, so we took this small-scale thing, actually this was always just the test bed platform. The goal was to take this to full scale, because of course, wouldn't you love to stand in the model that you're proposing to build? So we went down to MPAC. How many people have been to MPAC? <laughs> Everyone should go. There's a lot of stuff there. A lot of really nice spaces. Um, stuff happening all the time. Some artsy, some techy, some mix. Uh, anyways, we went down there. We, we um, are not carpenters, but we built some walls that are eight feet tall. We put them on wheels. <laughs> covered them with white material, either plywood or canvas, um, and you can shove them around. And we have a system to allow us to track where those walls are, again, using a camera. In this case, instead of using color-coded little slips of paper and stuff, um, in this full-scale system, we actually used uh, IR LEDs. So those little black circles are actually have an LED in the middle of them, and this allows us to track. It um, doesn't get confused by the projectors. So some technical reasons why we, we like this system for the uh, full-scale. Um, OK, so this is the full-scale system. Uh, just to give you a, a preview of what we can do, you can start with all white surfaces in the upper left. Uh, infrared camera images sees where those LEDs are, and we've uniquely placed those LEDs on the wall so we can keep track of, um, uniquely identify which wall is where. Um, and this is output from our tracking visualization. And then on the right, I can paint the walls virtually um, by telling which projectors, which pixels should be which color to, again, consistently color these things. And just to show you that it, it works dynamic, 
situations as well as these walls are moving around. We've got six people out there shoving six walls around. Um, in just a second, we will turn on the projectors and turn off the lights. And you can still kind of see it on the screen, but the walls are staying consistently colored even as they're moving. Of course, um, there's a little bit of wiggle because the walls aren't constructed perfectly. Uh, but uh, when they stop, they, they, get, they get calibrated pretty well. And just to show you that I can color walls, but that's not the only thing. Uh, the next thing we did, we really wanted to challenge ourselves building a five-piece jigsaw puzzle. So we took a panorama actually from Professor Stewart's uh, research. Uh, so it's just a long panorama image. We chopped it up into five pieces, assigned each chunk of texture to one of the walls in the system, we started them in some scram scrambled configuration. And then as you move the walls around, the texture stays stuck to the walls. Just for playing the video here. Um, Texture stays stuck and no matter which orientation you place it, we figure out which projector can see that wall and we put that texture on that surface. And again, as you get two walls that are um, supposed to be adjacent, when they get close enough to each other, the pieces will snap together. It's just a simple demo, of course. You know, five piece jigsaw puzzle, it took about five grad students to solve. Because uh, the walls are kind of heavy. <laughs> again, we're not great carpenters. Um, but prototype uh, demonstration. Okay, uh, so that's the jigsaw puzzle. And getting onto a slightly more serious application, we can use this for volumetric visualization. For example, uh, if you have a, you know, a, a medical data set, so you have a three-dimensional data set, we're going to take that data, embed it in the virtual environment, blow it up in this case to about eight feet tall, human head, uh, and that, that, that data is virtually in space. And as you push the physical wall through the virtual location of that data, uh, we will figure out what cross-section of the data it's seen, tell the projector that sees that wall best to go ahead and project on that surface and you get this visualization. And it works even if you rotate the wall around as well. So this will allow you to explore 3D data set with a, a, a virtual wall, excuse me, a physical wall, and this works um, in large scale. Other people have done this before in small scale, but this was the first full scale. And then of course coming back to our original motivation for this one is can we you know, do this uh, architectural visualization to allow you to stand inside of your room and see how the daylighting is going to perform. And the idea with this short little demo is if there's something you don't like about your, your current design, you want to make the room a little bit bigger, you can actually just go shove the walls. And it's not just a single person interaction. Anybody can go grab and push the walls around. That's why I really like uh, this multiple person interaction. It's not your traditional augmented reality where one person wears a head mounted display and they get to see all this cool stuff. No, we can, you know, as many people as we want into this space, and they all uh, have equal importance in terms of driving the simulation and pushing things around. Um, so here, I've taken my students and shrunk them down to be you know, about six inches tall, put them on my tabletop, and uh, this is, actually that's what I thought I was seeing when I first watched this video, because for so long I've been watching the video of the small scale system, that when I saw this I'm like, oh my gosh, my students, they're very small now. Um, but they can walk around and they get to see where the light is moving. And the claim for this is uh, an architect could bring the clients in. Sometimes the client might have a hard time understanding either a drawing or a, uh, even a, a computer simulation if you're just looking at it on a flat screen. Uh, but actually to bring them into the space, they'll understand the spatial relationships in the room a little bit more, actually start to understand how daily lighting is going to move around in space and uh, maybe make better decisions uh, for their designs. And then, of course, since this is RPI and we have a games major and a bunch of the students I work with are dual CS, GSAS majors, um, it wasn't surprising that they figured out how to make a game out of this as well. Um, it's pretty cool. I left one day. Daylighting was working. I was happy. The next day, I come in and complain calm. If I had sound on this, you would hear the wheels grinding <laughs> as they shove the walls across the floor. Fortunately, I think we only had a stubbed toe, no major injuries. So, not a bit good. All right, uh, coming back to the more technical part of this stuff, uh, we have a complex projection environment. So this isn't just a dark room with a single flat screen. We actually have multiple surfaces that we're projecting on. And we have to be concerned about um, scattering between those surfaces. So this is just a simple uh, uh, simulation to show you. Say we had a room that was all white. It's a little L-shaped box room with a table, some simple geometry, and it's all white, no lights, uh, this is just what it looks like uh, on the left. But we want to uh, simulate what the space would look like if we colored some of the walls and installed some area lights on the ceiling. 
So the middle is our desired appearance. We want to allow people to walk into the space and experience the, the, uh, what it would look like if we made these changes to the room. So if we naively take the textures in that middle image and use projectors to project them on the surfaces, we're going to end up with a thing over there on the right. What the heck happened? You know, we projected the right answer, what we wanted, on those surfaces, and we get this totally washed out thing. Actually, it looks even more washed out in this projector, uh, but everything is very pastel. You don't see the vivid colors, and it's just, in general, too bright. And certainly, if I just turned down the brightness, it would solve the problem partially, but it would still be really washed out. Uh, so what's happening? Well, when you project uh, white light on the floor, it's not just going on the floor. It's also scattering on all the other surfaces, because again, the original room, they're white surfaces. So you don't want to project too much white on the floor because you're going to get extra white on the left wall. And you don't need to project this like pinkish tone on the left wall because you're going to get scattering from the floor too. So how do you figure out what you should project so that your final appearance of the room is as close as possible to your desired appearance? Uh, so this is a question that's been asked before. Um, another researcher proposed something called reverse radiosity. I won't explain what radiosity is, but they figured out how to basically do the inverse calculation. And so for the desired appearance and the known material properties of the room, they can figure out what to project on those surfaces, that's that middle stuff, in order to get the ideal solution. Unfortunately, uh, the, tr the way they described reverse radiosity, which is a simple inverse, um, they got negative components for their projection, negative values of light. And I know you guys are amazingly smart, but I don't think you can invent a projector that emits negative light, right? Kind of impossible in the physical world. Uh, but if you go and you dig out and look at their solution for this particular example and for many other examples, they have negative components of light. And if we look, this is a negative, like basically it's saying we want to suck uh, green and blue light <coughs> off of the left wall to make it look red. That's how they're making the left wall look red, by removing green and red light. Because there's a lot of white scattering around in the room and RGB. So this is what you should project, this negative light. Then you get the exact solution. But of course, um, what you're probably going to do when you get this solution vector back again is just chuck the negative components, zero them out, only project the positive quantities, which in this case is pretty much just the light sources on the ceiling, and that's what you get on the, on the right. So it's kind of a surprising and disappointing result for, for their method. So we went back and we looked at it and we said, well, clearly what we need to do is do an optimization here, a non-negative least squares optimization of this color space. Um, and so our solution is in the upper right. Our, well, excuse me, our solution this is what we decide to project in the middle which is kind of what you'd do if you did by hand. If you want to make it look as much as possible like this, you'd project saturated red light on the left wall and use the indirect scattering that's going to happen naturally and you'll get pretty close to the, the answer. So this is the optimal solution in the top middle and our result, which you can see isn't an exact match to the desired appearance because this is, too, this is a hard problem. Uh, but it's uh, the optimal solution uh, to get as close as possible. So the work we did. Um, oh, there's math. Does anyone want to talk about math? <laughs> It's summer, right? Oh, you don't count. <laughs> uh, there's math, um, and here are some, of our, uh, some of our results on our, our physical environment. Again, the desired scene. This is a top row is all simulated images, but the bottom row these are all photographs of our table. So if you just naively grab the desired imagery, project it on the walls, you get this washed out thing happening. Um, reverse radiosity, the previous work. Um, actually, if you look at this left wall, we've lost the window. And actually, the, our rendering of windows is a little non-intuitive. They're black squares. Uh, but ignoring that strange UI choice, uh, you can't see the window at all here because, again, this uh, reverse radiosity is relying on negative light to get that color uh, in their solution. And then, actually, the two on the right are both our work. Um, one is optimizing in a linear color space. And if you know about human perception, actually, we see color in non-uniform. Um, uh, and so this is a Non-linear uh, color space, it's harder, much more expensive to do the calculation, but you get a better result. And that's all detail to talk about later. Um, this is just highlighting again a recent paper we had. Um, again, not to belabor too much the implementation, but uh, especially for that non-linear optimization, there was a lot of stuff. Yusheng, if anyone knows Yusheng, amazing PhD student, put all these things together, made it happen very fast. Uh, the simulation would take 30 minutes in MATLAB for his first draft, and he got it down to you know one or two frames a second using GPU. So it's pretty amazing. But all this stuff happened, and, and just to, to say, uh, you know, open source stuff is great. He was able to pull this off by taking a lot of work from other people and bringing it together. And there's a lot of um, code sharing on GPU stuff, and, and it's just great. I think some of these were perhaps at least one of these was something we had to buy.
but for the most part, we're, we're making heavy use of open source stuff and putting this together.